Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the Montgomery County Office of Procurement Prevailing Wage Law webinar. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bethany Manimbo. I'm the Marketing and Outreach Manager here at the Office of Procurement, and I am joined today. Uh, Steve Nagara is our new Prevailing Wage Law Program Manager, so I'd like to introduce Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. And uh, we'll be having Deborah Wilder present the, uh, the program today. But before doing so, I just wanted to mention some of the updates uh, that took place last year to the law. Uh, the law was amended and affected July 4th. The changes um, reduced the threshold to $250,000. And that was from $500,000. And that's in line with the state. Uh, also, the definition of construction was, was updated and amended to be more inclusive um, with repairs, rehab, service, and maintenance contracts. So what used to be subject to the wage requirements law is now subject to the prevailing wage law. And finally, we have a local hiring goal which requires best efforts to hire Montgomery County residents for at least 25% of the new jobs to complete the county finance construction contract. And uh, again, thanks for being here. My name is Steve Nogueira. I'm the new uh, program manager for the prevailing wage law. Just wanted to mention that one of my goals here is, is to leave an impact not only on the folks that I work with here at the uh, Department of Procurement, but also on the contracting community. So to do so, I'm here to help you be successful with the prevailing wage law. Just know you can reach out to me anytime if you have any questions. I'm here for you. Uh, now, without further ado, I present to you Ms. Deborah Wilder. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to be um, presenting today on an update on the uh, prevailing wage requirements uh, for Montgomery County. Many of you may have been to our sessions before. Um, I'm with a company called Contractor Compliance and Monitoring Inc. We're a prevailing wage consulting company. And we've been working with Montgomery County since 2009. And I'm pleased to be, um, again, including uh, this presentation with you today. So I'm going to start with this slide deck. And we're going to go over um, the requirements for prevailing wage for Montgomery County, including uh, many of the new requirements that Steve mentioned. Um, if you have questions, um, please post them in the um, chat box. Is that correct? I want to put them in the chat box or do I want to put them in the Q&A? Um, either one. All right. Um, let's put them in the chat box. Then I only have to look at one spot while we're doing this. Um, the, the webinar is being recorded. So um, I know the county in the past has put that up on the website. So you can look at that again. Um, and I, I do want this to be interactive. So if you have questions, there's quite a few of you. So please um, put your questions into the chat box. And I will be happy to look at them and answer them as we go along. So the original prevailing wage requirement was originally adopted in September of 2008, and it became effective July 1. Um, earlier, uh, earlier, Steve mentioned that the original threshold for prevailing wage used to be $500,000. It has now been changed, and it applies to uh, construction and construction related projects that are in excess of $250,000. Um, and then the county has also adopted many of Maryland's, the state's prevailing wage requirements, but not all of them. So we're going to, um, there's just, there's just uh, one regarding training they did not adopt. So um, let me go ahead and review all of those for you. So um, this covers construction work and it covers construction work that is on site. So if you're performing work back in your permanent shop and that work in your shop is not covered by prevailing wage. So work performed on site is covered by prevailing wage and work performed in your shop, your permanent shop is not covered by prevailing wage. 
So every once in a while, I have a contractor who says, I got that on site covered, off site not covered. So, how about if I set up a temporary shop across the street from this project, um, this big long project? And we do work at this temporary site, which is adjacent or nearly adjacent to the project site. That um, is not recognized as off site work because you're setting that up even though it's technically offsite, you're setting it up merely to service that particular project. And um, it is essentially right next to or just down the block. So if you want to do any work in a shop and want to have it excluded from prevailing wage, you're going to need to do that in your permanent shop. Um, so excluded work, as, as I mentioned earlier, is work performing your permanent shop. A pure supplier delivery. So let's just say we're making cabinets and the cabinets are going to be installed in this building. And I'm not, I'm I'm the cabinet maker. I'm not installing the cabinets, I'm just making the cabinets. So I can get a truck and I can deliver those cabinets to the job site and offload them, maybe put them in a container in one location. And I can leave again and none of my drive time or unloading my truck at the site is covered by prevailing wage because I am a supplier. That is different if I am also installing the cabinets. So if I am installing the cabinets, then I have to make sure that my workers who are unloading the truck full of cabinets is paid prevailing wage for that unloading of the work and taking them to the container or wherever they're going to be at. So if I'm a pure supplier, no prevailing wage applies. Professional services are also generally excluded from prevailing wage. That is, if I'm a surveyor, if I'm uh, an inspector, if I'm coming in and doing material testing, maybe I'm taking core samples, maybe I'm x-raying the concrete to see if there are, uh, if there's rebar in the concrete, um, those types of professional services are not covered by prevailing wage um, in Montgomery County. So let's talk about who is covered. So employees on the project, so individuals who are working with the tools and performing the work on the project. Um, there is an exemption for those who are in a supervise, uh, supervisory or management position. Um, so if you are typically exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act, Section 541, if that's an exemption from overtime because you're a management employee, you are overseeing two or more employees, you have, there's a variety of um, criteria that makes you an, a, an exempt employee. So if you're one of those exempt employees or if you're an owner, you are typically exempt from the payment of prevailing wages on these projects. A working supervisor, a working foreman, a working lead man is, um, are all covered by prevailing wage. So um, again, if you've got a, a, a superintendent that spends most of their time or a supervisor that spends most of their time, um, you know, directing work, talking to suppliers, um, whatnot, and they're not working with the tools, then that's considered not um, subject to prevailing wage. I want to point out that there is no such thing as 1099 employees. Sometimes contractors get confused about that. There are employees who are working for you and they're performing work on the project and they're subject to prevailing wage. If you are hiring any type of temporary worker, to perform work with the tools on the project, then they're a temporary employee and they are entitled to full prevailing wages and the appropriate you know, state and federal deductions out of their paycheck. A 1099 form is a form that you send to independent contractors. These are individuals or companies that have an independent business 
They typically work for more than one company. They typically have employees most of the time, but there's no such thing as a 1099 employee. There are regular employees, there's full-time employees, there's part-time employees, there's um, temporary employees, but there's no such thing as a 1099 employee. So keep that in mind as that's a question that um, we frequently get asked. So prevailing wages is a combination of wages and fringe benefits that have to be paid to each employee or if not directly to the employee for his or her benefit. So usually there's a two-part component. There's a wage amount and there's a fringe benefit amount. If you do not have fringe benefits that equal the fringe benefits listed on the wage determination, then you're gonna to have to put the, those dollars on the employee's paycheck. So the employee's paycheck, we're going to look at the wages that are being paid. We're going to look at the fringe benefits that you're paying on behalf of your workers. And both of those things combined have to equal that total hourly rate. And that's what we're going to be checking for. So some employers have, um, some employers are union signatory. And so you have a certain amount you put on the paycheck and a certain amount that goes to the union trust funds for um, employee benefits. Some employers are open shop contractors. They're not signatory with the union and they have some kind of benefit plan. So we figure out how much of that benefit um, uh, is, cre is credited towards the prevailing wage project. And we take the wages plus the benefits paid and that's got to equal the total amount. Some employers, don't have benefits that they pay to the workers. And so then they're going to have to take that total amount of wages and fringe benefits and pay that all to the employee on their paycheck. So it's a combination, various combinations, depending on how your company operates. Let me give you an example. Let's just say the prevailing wage rate is $35 an hour and the fringe benefit is $18 an hour, and you have maybe health and welfare that you provide to your employees, and that's worth $5 an hour. So what that means is you have to take that other $13, remember fringes are 18, minus the five that you get credit for, you have another $13 in benefits that maybe it needs to go to a pension plan, a vision plan, a dental plan, disability, life insurance. But if you have no place else to put that to pay for a benefit for the worker, then that $13 is going to have to go on the employee's paycheck. So at the end of the day, the worker would then get $48 in wages, $5 in fringe benefits, um, and that would equal the total package of $53. If I didn't have any fringe benefits, the worker would get $53 on their paycheck. If I had lots of fringe benefits, the worker would get $35 on their paycheck and perhaps a whole $18 in fringe benefits would be paid to um, a third party. So that's the combination of things. And it, it, a benefit has to benefit the worker. So, for example, if you provide life insurance for your employees and you're going to pay for that, um, you can take credit for the amount the employer pays, but the employee gets to choose the beneficiary. Um, I know this sounds kind of crazy, but a couple of years ago, we ran across a company that was paying for life insurance for all its workers and it, and, and it designated the company as the beneficiary. Well, that doesn't benefit the worker, that benefits the company. And so that benefit was not allowed for the purposes of prevailing wage. So it can be a medical plan, a dental plan, a vision plan, disability, a lot of other um, benefit plans are out there. So we're just gonna wanna make sure that it benefits the worker and that um, the benefit is not forfeited so that means when the employee leaves 
um, their employment with you, you don't say, oh, I know we, we said we were going to give you these pension contributions, but you left. So, you know, just kidding. You don't get them if you leave. Well, that means the, the employee would forfeit those contributions when they left. And if that's the case, then you don't get to count those pension contributions, or you don't get to count that particular leave program or whatever it is you're doing. So the employee has to be vested in any money that's placed into um, a benefit for them. All right, let's, let's move on. So workers are paid based on the type of tools that they're being used and the type of work they're being performed, not necessarily on job titles and not necessarily based on their individual skill set. So let's just talk about this. So if I'm working on a project and you hired me as a laborer, I come to work, you say, hey, Deborah, I need you to unload the truck. So I unload the truck for an hour. And so for that first hour, I am a laborer because that's the type of work I was performing. I was performing general labor's work. I was unloading the truck. Then you come over to me and say, hey, we're a little shorthanded today. Would you please go up to the second floor and help hang drywall? Now I've rarely hung drywall, but I go up to the second floor and I try, try to work and I hang drywall and I hang drywall for three hours. And then the supervisor comes up and says, oh my goodness, this is horrible. Um, we're not going to have you hang drywall anymore. Um, go take your lunch. And when you come back, we're going to have you paint over here. And so for the rest of the afternoon, I paint for four hours. So I have to be paid not less than one hour at a labor wage rate, three hours for hanging drywall. Doesn't matter how unskilled I am. Doesn't matter that you hired me as a laborer. If I was performing drywall work, I get paid in the carpentry drywall classification. And then for the rest of the day, the last four hours, I have to be paid not less than four hours as a painter. So I use this illustration. This is kind of a crazy illustration, but I use it to show you that I am paid based on what I am being asked to do. And it has nothing to do with what position I was hired in or what my personal skill set is. So if you take somebody who doesn't know anything and you say, hey, go help install the sink, they may be paid as a plumber, even though they don't have a lot of skill sets as a plumber. So just keep that in mind. The other thing that we sometimes deal with is omitted or missing classifications. Um, this doesn't happen frequently, but every once in a while we'll be working on a project and somebody says, Hey, our contract is for, um, you know, window coverings. We're doing, we're installing, you know, louvers or shutters or curtains or blinds or something. And we see that there's not a classification for that. And we believe there should be a separate classification for that. So you can go ahead and contact our Maryland staff. Um, I have a new employee, Tracy Van Sant, who recently started with us a couple of months ago, and her information is on the final slide deck, um, and you can contact her, or even better, go ahead and contact Steve Nagara, the program manager for the Labor Compliance Program. Um, I'm hoping that's still a good number there, um, and he can work with you and us and uh, the state to figure out what the proper classification might be. That is so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, did you want to say yeah. something, Steve? Yeah, that is a good number. And I also put my contact information in the chat. Okay, so this is a good number, but his number is also in the chat. So let's just keep that in mind. So if you don't know what classification to classify your workers at, or if it's like, it's just not there, 
putting down unskilled labor is not the answer. We've had contractors who've done that going, well, we didn't find it. So we just call them unskilled laborers. No, we really need to get to the bottom of that question. So if you have a question, I'm going to invite you to call Steve and um, he'll work with us and we will get you an answer um, as to what the classification is and what the proper wage and fringe benefit is. But please don't just assume because you don't have a classification that you're going to make this person an unskilled laborer because that is not the, uh, not the proper way to do that. So let me move on and I wanna talk about overtime. Um, overtime in Maryland and Montgomery County is paid after 10 hours worked in one day or 40 hours worked in one week. Um, you can work Monday through Saturday any of those days, 10 hours a day, not more than 40 hours a week, and that is fine. If you work on Sun, if you work more than 10 hours a day, if you work more than 40 hours a week, if you work on Sunday, if you work on the holidays listed below, then you're going to be required to pay an overtime rate. Now, I understand that you may not actually be working, quote, overtime on Sunday. You know, you might, for whatever reason, maybe you didn't work Monday and Tuesday during the week and everybody wants to get a full paycheck and they're working Wednesday through Sunday. But if you work on Sunday, the workers are entitled to the overtime rate. So I call it premium pay. So if you're going to work on Sunday, your workers get premium pay that equals time and a half over time for working on Sunday. Um, the state and the county also have designated holidays. So if you work on these days, your workers also get a premium rate, which is equal to the overtime rate for the work they're performing. Now, if in fact you don't work on Memorial Day, everybody gets the day off, you do not have to pay the worker for that day, okay? Don't have to pay them work for work. They didn't perform any work that day. There is no requirement that you pay them if they are not working on that day. So this premium pay applies only if they are actually working on these holidays. Do me a favor, check the footnotes on your determination in case there are any additional holidays that apply to specific trades. We're gonna talk about what happens when you are on a federally funded project. When you're on a federally funded project, federal Davis-Bacon rules apply and they may have different holidays. So do yourself a favor and always check the footnotes on the wage termination to determine if there's any additional holidays that are claimed. So let me also point out that overtime is only paid on the wage rate. Remember before I said we had a wage rate of, um, well, I'm gonna use this example because I have it here. There's a base wage rate of $25 an hour and there's $10 in fringe benefits. So I'm gonna pay time and a half on the base wage rate and then just add the fringe benefits as a straight $10. There's no overtime calculated on fringe benefits. So that's how I get to 4750 and not to a different number. This is true even if you're paying all the fringes on the employee's paycheck. You only have to pay overtime on the wage amount and not the fringe amount. The exception to that rule is if the employee's normal base wage rate is more than the prevailing wage rate. So let's just say the employee's base wage rate is $30 an hour. You're now working on a prevailing wage project and for some reason the prevailing wage rate is $25 an hour you still have to pay the worker um, not less than their base wage rate, and then you would pay overtime on that base wage rate, okay? 
one of the things that people get confused about is let's just say I don't have any fringe benefits. So I'm going to pay the base wage rate and the fringes on the employee's paycheck at $35 an hour. So when the employee works overtime, they're confused. They're confused why they are only getting $57.50 an hour because in their mind, overtime ab um, at time and a half of $35 an hour is $52.50. They're going to say, how is that? Why is that? And you're going to go back and say, well, I only have to pay overtime on the prevailing wage rate, not on the fringe benefit package. And that applies even if I pay everything on the paycheck. And, you know, and most employers will say, oh, okay. But, you know, they, they might be a little uncertain about that. So let me give you, I, I will, a, tr a trick of the trade that I'm going to suggest that if you're paying any of your fringe benefit rates on the paycheck, that you should make that a separate line item on the pay stub. And the reason I do that is because then it is super easy for the employee to understand that they got time and a half for the wages. So let's just say I have 25 hours that the employee is working um, at, at their regular rate of pay, which let's just say is $22 an hour. So the pay stub will show 25 hours times $22 an hour. And then they'll say, okay, I have 15 straight time hours on this prevailing wage project at $25 an hour. And I have five overtime hours on this project, which is going to be paid at $37.50. That's time and a half of the 25. So I have 15 prevailing wage hours at straight time and five hours of overtime. And then I'm gonna have a separate line item that says 20 hours, the, the straight time and the overtime hours times $10 an hour times that fringe benefit. So I call out the fringe benefit as a separate line item. So the worker can see, yes, I was paid that fringe benefit in cash, if you will, on the paycheck for the full 20 hours the 15 straight time hours and the five overtime hours. And yes, I can see I was paid time and a half for those five hours based on that wage rate. So there's no requirement that you do it this way. This is just a tip that we've picked up over the years that helps make the payment of wages and overtime a little clearer to workers. Now, some of you will be union signatory and the fringe benefits are going to your union trust funds and that's perfectly acceptable and the paycheck will show the base wage rate in time and a half on the base wage rate. But this is a comment for open shop contractors who are having to pay some other fringes on the paycheck. So I already mentioned fringe benefits a little bit before, but let me go over that all of the fringe benefits have to meet. Um, the top five criteria, and then we'll talk about amortization. So obviously the benefit has to be a benefit for the employee. Um, charging employees for uh, company t-shirts that they wear on the project is typically um, not considered a benefit for the worker. Um, so it's going to be health and welfare. It's going to be... Um, you know, some kind of benefit, um, pension, they, uh, some kind of um, unemployment, disability, vision care, that type of thing. The employee has to qualify for the benefit. So that means if you're going to take a credit of your fringe benefits toward meeting the prevailing wage, obviously the employee has to qualify for that benefit and be receiving that benefit. Benefits have to be definite and certain. So if we ever go out and we ask an employee, hey, uh, you know, how much are you making on this prevailing wage project? And they say, oh, I'm making, you know, $42 an hour. And we say, are you getting any kind of fringe benefits, health and welfare or whatever? I don't need them to say yes. 
we get $17.22 paid per hour for this, for our health and welfare and whatever. I just need them, I just need to un have them understand that they in fact do have that benefit. So, um, so they, they have to be able to know that they have a benefit and, and basically know what that benefit is. Um, the contribution has to be irrevocably made. Typically contributions are made on a monthly basis. They can be made as infrequently as quarterly, but the limitation is quarterly. So if you're paying benefits to a pension plan or a health and welfare plan, they can be paid weekly, they can be paid monthly, they can be paid quarterly, but they cannot be paid annually, only once a year. And then some benefits have to be amortized. Pension is treated a little differently. There are Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor and ERISA guidelines. ERISA is a federal law for the Employer Retirement Investment Security Act, and it covers how <clears throat> a variety of fringe benefits is are, are handled um, for, for workers. So there are um, special Davis-Bacon or prevailing wage plans out there that allow employers to take the bulk of the fringe benefit amount and pay those directly to a pension plan. Those pension plans have very special rules. They typically have immediate vesting, which means that money belongs to the employee, you know, right out of the box. Um, there's no forfeiture. The employee leaves, they still have the right to that money. Um, so the Davis-Bacon or the prevailing wage pension plan is recognized within the state of Maryland, within the county of Montgomery, and um, also on federal projects. I want to point out that profit sharing plans do not um, count towards prevailing wage credit. And let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> if I have a profit sharing plan, and we're sitting here today in April, um, I can't take a credit for a, pro a, a, a contribution I may make on behalf of my employees at the end of the year. Because number one, I have to have a profit. And as I sit here today in April, I don't know if I'm going to make a profit. I don't know if I'm going to make that profit until the end of the year. And then I get to decide, okay, maybe I have some kind of vesting requirements. Maybe employees have to work for me. Maybe they have to be employed at the end of the year. Maybe they have to be employed um, at least, you know, 26 weeks during the year. It's April. I don't know, employees could leave next week. So their benefit is not definite and certain. I don't know if I'm gonna make a profit. I don't know if they're going to vest. And then even if those things happen, then the company in a profit sharing plan says, oh, well, we're going to pay 3% of um, everybody's compensation um, as a contribution to the profit sharing plan. And you're saying, well, 3%, but last year it was 10 or the year before it was two or seven or whatever it is. So a profit sharing plan, the, the payments being made in a profit sharing plan, there are legitimate deductions and business expenses, but they do not count towards credit toward meeting fringe benefits. <clears throat> so let's talk about amortization and how you would count health and welfare benefits, or how you would count vacation and holiday that you pay. So let's just assume you are an open shop contractor and you pay some type of health care benefit. And you pay um, a benefit on behalf of the worker. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that premium. So let me just say for, for illustration purposes, I have a health care plan and for Johnny, I pay $600 a month towards his premiums. I take the monthly premium of $600 a month. I multiply 
multiply it by 12 months of a year. And I divide that by 2,080 hours, well, that's work hours in a year. And I get an hourly rate of $3.46. So I could claim for Johnny that I'm paying him his wages and I get to claim $3.46 an hour towards a health and welfare benefit. Now, let's just say I've got Sarah and Sarah has a family and her premium is $1,000 a month and she pays part of it and the company pays part of it. So let's just say the company will pay $700 and Sarah's gonna pay $300. So I only get to claim the portion that the company pays. So that's $700 times 12 months out of the year divided by 2,080 hours. And that is $4.04 an hour that I get to claim. So if you're going to claim health and welfare benefits and the premiums are obviously different for different workers, you take the amount the company is paying and you run those calculations individually. Um, I always do them once a year when the new premiums come out. I put them on a spreadsheet. It's easy for me just to upload that or forward that on to you know, whoever may, may need that. And then the only time that spreadsheet has to be updated is if there's a change because typically health and welfare only gets changed once a year. But if there's an event where you're adding a dependent or uh, deducting a dependent, then that premium um, would in fact change. And that's the only time you would have to, to do that. So let me now talk about <clears throat> vacation and holiday. So if you have a written policy that grants employees vacation or paid holidays, and it's enforceable, which means if you leave the company, we're gonna cash you out. We're gonna pay you for your accrued vacation. If you have a policy that says, well, you can accrue, let's just say the sick time, but if you leave, we're not paying you for that sick time, then you don't get to count the sick time for the purposes of prevailing wage. But let's just say you have a policy that says, um, everybody accrues not less than um, two weeks vacation a year. So that's 80 hours. And we pay five vacations a year. The company chooses to do that. Um, so whether you work or don't work, we're still going to pay you for those five vacation hours. That's another 40 hours. So I have a total of 120 hours between vacation and holiday that I have in a written policy, which is enforceable and which the um, employees can, can count on. I take that 120 hours, I multiply it by the employee's regular rate of pay. Not what they're making on this particular prevailing wage project, but what is their regular rate of pay? When they take that vacation, when they take that holiday, what is their hourly rate? So let's just say, their hourly rate is $30 an hour. So I'm gonna take 120 vacation holiday hours. I'm gonna multiply it by the $30 an hour the employee is going to get when they take that vacation and holiday. And then I'm gonna divide that by 2,080, the number of work hours in a year. And that will give me a credit of $1.73. So I would get to claim $1.73 an hour as part of the vacation and holiday. So if I have a fringe benefit package, um, let's see what I got here. So if I have a fringe benefit package <clears throat> that is say $10 an hour and I'm going to, Hold on here. So under the first example where we had Johnny who got $3.46 an hour for health and welfare, and then we have a hundred and a hundred a dollar seventy-three in vacation, then what I'm going to see is 
that is going to equal, hold on, 346 plus 173. That's going to equal $5.19 an hour. Remember, my fringe benefit package was $10 an hour. So that means I get credit for $5.19. And the other $4.81, I have nowhere to put that. That $4.81 has to go on the employee's paycheck. So I just wanted to explain that in a illustrative way. All right, let me move on to um, apprenticeship rules. Only those individuals who are actively enrolled in an approved apprenticeship committee program can be paid an apprenticeship rate. So what that means is if you have someone who's working uh, with you and they're enrolled in a union apprenticeship program, uh, an apprenticeship program that's that's maybe not affiliated with the union, but it's approved by the state. Um, you can use those apprentices as long as they're actively enrolled. What is actively enrolled is that means they're, you know, they're attending their programs and whatnot. It doesn't mean, oh, well, they enrolled in an apprenticeship program last year, but they haven't been to a class in six months. No, that's not being actively enrolled. Um, picking up uh, some day laborers and saying, hey, I know you guys don't know anything about construction. Uh, we're going to make you apprentices. We're going to pay you this apprentice rate. Come on out to our project. They are not apprentices because they are not actively enrolled in a state-approved apprenticeship program. So again, they may not have the skill of a complete skill set of a full journeyman, but you do not get to call them apprentices and you do not get to pay them as apprentices because they're not enrolled in an apprenticeship program. If you hire day laborers to come out to the project, you are going to be paying them at the journeyman wage rate. Now, I should let you know that any apprenticeship programs that are approved <clears throat> by the state of Maryland, Virginia, or Washington, D.C., um, are allowed to work as apprentices in Maryland. That used to not be the rule. They've, re they've changed that an, a number of years ago. So that if I have, um, you might have a contractor who's based in Washington, D.C. or based in Virginia, and they're coming into Maryland to do this work, they can bring their apprentices with them and pay at the apprenticeship rate. Now, be aware, it's only Maryland, Virginia, or Washington, D.C. So if I have a contractor coming in from Pennsylvania and they wanna use their apprentices from a program in Pennsylvania, nope, they've gotta be paid journeyman wages. So it's only apprentices that are enrolled in programs in Maryland, Virginia, or Washington, D.C. Um, that are allowed. One of the other things about apprentices is that apprentices must be properly supervised. The whole reason of an apprenticeship program is it's kind of like an on-the-job training program. And the apprentice is supposed to be learning um, from the uh, journeyman on the project. And so apprentices have to be supervised. You cannot submit a certified payroll that shows me you have three apprentices on the project and no journeyman. That, that will then require that those apprentices be paid journeyman wages. And somebody said, but they're just apprentices. Right, but if they are not properly supervised, then the prevailing wage requirements are if they're not properly supervised, then they cannot be employed, quote, as apprentices, and therefore you've got to pay them journeyman wages and benefits. The other thing is that apprentices must be employed in a proper ratio. So if I have one plumber and 10 apprentices, yes, they're being supervised, I get that, but the apprenticeship standards agreement says this is the proper ratio in which you may employ apprentices. So maybe it's one apprentice to one journeyman, or it might be two journeymen to one apprentice. It's rarely more apprentices than journeymen. And, and maybe you belong to a 
particular program that will allow more apprentices than journeymen, but those are few and far between. We will be asking for a copy of your apprenticeship agreement that has that ratio in it for anything other than a one-to-one -one ratio. So in my example for my one plumber journeyman and my 10 apprenticeships, uh, pr apprentices on the project, nine of those apprentices will now be paid at full journeyman wages and benefits because they were employed out of ratio. So we want to encourage you to train the next generation of construction workers. We want to encourage you to use apprentices, but you need to know that all the apprentices must be properly supervised and they must be employed in a proper ratio. Some programs have pre-apprentices or sometimes they call them helpers. Helpers are not permitted on prevailing wage projects. If you have a helper, they're gonna get paid as a journeyman. If you have a pre-apprentice, they're gonna be paid as a journeyman. Unless you get those pre-apprentices enrolled in the apprenticeship program, and then they can count obviously as a level one apprentice. So um, again, you, you're not allowed to, to just say, hey, this person is a helper, this person is a trainee. Um, and I get to pay them at this lesser helper or trainee rate. No. Um, I have this conversation um, several times with um, union signatory contractors who says my collective bargaining agreement allows me to have a helper. This is typical. Um, I was supposed to say there's plumbers and mo a lot of collective bargaining agreements have plumbers helper. That's great because that's what's in your collective bargaining agreement, but neither the state or the county or the federal government recognizes any helper classifications. So if you're going to try to employ a plumber's helper or a, or a, or a trainee, they're going to have to be paid at the journeyman wage rate. So just keep that in mind that... Um, you may have a collective bargaining agreement that says I get to do something else. If that something else is less than what Maryland and Montgomery County require, the answer is no. You're going to have to comply with the higher requirement by the state and or the county. If your collective bargaining agreement says, oh, I have to pay more or I have a work rule that, that is more stringent than what the city and the county requires, then you have a contractual agreement to do that. So let's just say your collective bargaining agreement says you have to pay overtime after eight hours in a day. Maryland doesn't require that, Montgomery County doesn't require that, but you have a separate contractual obligation under your collective bargaining agreement to do that. So basically, if you are a union signatory contractor, you basically have to comply with the higher of the two. So if um, Montgomery County has a higher requirement, you need to comply with that. If your collective bargaining agreement has a higher requirement, you need to comply with that. All right, here's where the state of Maryland and Montgomery County um, parted company on uh, an aspect of prevailing wage. So the state of Maryland adopted a separate obligation to contribute a portion of the prevailing wage amount to training committees. This is typically, you know, a fairly small amount. It's, you know, 25 cents an hour or a dollar an hour that would go to, say, a community college training program for apprenticeship or um, some other approved apprenticeship committee. Montgomery County chose not to adopt this additional requirement. So if your union signatory and your collective bargaining agreement says you've got to be paying a training contribution, then you need to be paying that training contribution. But Montgomery County did not adopt this. And so we will not be enforcing the payment of a training contribution um, to a third party. One of the things that Montgomery County typically does is it has CCMI, that's our company, conduct on-site visits. 
We typically try to do that once a month. Sometimes it doesn't work. You got crazy weather, you got rain, you got snow, you've got a concrete pour going on. We're not coming that day. Um, you're setting steel. We're not coming that day. Um, but we typically try to get out to all the projects once a month. And um, the purpose of that is to randomly select a handful of workers, interview them fairly quickly so they're not taken away from the work. And we can take that information and cross-reference it to the certified payrolls that, um, that we review. So for example, when we go out to a project, we will typically check in with, um, if there's a trailer, we'll check in at the job site trailer. If you're working on a road crew, we'll, we typically let you know ahead of time when we're gonna be out to the project. Um, and uh, right now, Tracy Van Sant uh, is doing our, our job walks out there. Um, so she'll go out and she'll call you ahead of time, we'll let you know we're coming out. Um, we'll come out, we'll check in with whoever's the superintendent on the project or the supervisor on the project, and we'll see who's working. And we'll try and interview a cross section of workers from a cross section of subcontractors uh, and across a sub uh, across the trades. So if you've got carpenters and plumbers and electricians, we'll try to interview some of those. We typically try to interview between three to 10. A lot of that de depends on how large the project is. Um, and the questions we ask, let me just be totally upfront. The questions we ask are, hi, what's your name? Who do you work for? How long have you been working on this project? Uh, what kind of work are you doing on this project? What kind of tools are you using on this project? Um, about how much do you make per hour while you're working on this project? Um, are you receiving any kind of fringe benefits from your employer, like health and welfare or pension, vacation, holiday, any of that? Or is everything just on the paycheck? Um, I don't need the employee to tell me that they're making $37, $37 and 13 cents an hour. But I do need the employee to be able to give me a ballpark of what they're making. It could be, oh, I make about 30. 30 bucks an hour. Well, maybe that's the net or, you know, I don't know. I make 35, $37 an hour, or I don't know. I make about 50 bucks an hour. I don't have any benefits, whatever. So we're looking for a ballpark. What I'm really looking for, I'll be honest with you, is the employee who says, Hey, I just got a raise. I just got a raise to $15 an hour. Hey, that's great. When did you get that raise? Oh, I got that raise last week. How long have you been working on this project? Oh, I've been out here for four months. Whoa, whoa, how much were you making before? Oh, I was making 12 bucks an hour before. And, uh, and, and do you work just 40 hours a week? Oh, no, no, no. I work like 60 hours a week. We work 10 hours a day, six days a week. <clears throat> and then, you know, do you work overtime? Do you get paid extra money? for working more than 40 hours a week? Oh, no, 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 no. We just get paid, you know, I just get paid my 15 bucks an hour. Well, we won't engage the employee in that conversation beyond just getting those facts. But you can tell right then and there, we've got a, we've got a prevailing wage issue. We've got a prevailing wage issue because that individual is not being paid the correct prevailing wage rate. They're not being paid the correct overtime. And we'll take that information back and we'll cross-check it with the certified payroll. I want to make sure that that worker is listed on the certified payroll. And I want to make sure that the proper hourly rate is listed. So if the employee tells me, oh, I just got a raise to $15 an hour, and the certified payroll says they're making $35 an hour, we've got an issue and we've got an issue that needs to be investigated. So um, we're always looking for tru truthful representations on the certified payrolls. They are in fact certified under penalty of perjury. So they should be accurate and correct. Um, but we take that information and we cross-reference it back to the certified payrolls. The other thing that's required is the posting of prevailing wage rates are required on each job site. And it's required by the county that you do this. 
So um, typically if there's a, a prime contractor and there's a trailer, all those wage rates should just be posted either um, in the trailer or there should be a notice on the job board. If you have a job board outside that says, hey, prevailing wage rate are posted, are, are kept in the job trailer. Come on in if you need to have a question about that. Um, so we're looking for <clears throat> interviewing workers and we're looking for um, the wage rates to be posted. Again, we're randomly interviewing the, the workers. We ask the workers to carry a recent pay stub with them. A lot of them do this, some of them don't. Uh, we may ask them for a driver's license or some other ID if there's a question there. Um, so we typically ask them for you know some kind of identification. Um, if we have the paycheck, we'll take a quick look at the paycheck to make sure that it's, um, that the, and we'll make a notice to the, the wage rate that's on that particular paycheck. Um, I, I have noticed on the project, I was out walking, pro, I was out walking projects last month in Maryland. Um, and some of the workers don't speak uh, English as their first language. And uh, we're trying to get a uh, Spanish interpreter. Uh, to work with us on that. Um, I want to thank you for the co-workers and the supervisors out there who have helped us translate. Uh, my Spanish is marginal at best. Um, so um, I want to uh, thank everybody who has somebody on the job site that will help us uh, with that translation. So they're called certified payrolls because they are sworn under penalty of perjury. The county accepts the certified payroll through a system called LCP Tracker. We do not accept hard copy payrolls. Um, everything has to be submitted through LCP Tracker. Um, LCP Tracker is not a program we own. It's a third party program but um, I find it to be a very easy program um, just to input your information and upload any documents that need to be. So it's important that you submit the payrolls within 14 days after the end of each payroll period. This is a requirement the county has. If your payroll is not submitted within 14 days after the end of the payroll period, there are liquidated damages. There is, for lack of a better word, a fine. Um, liquidated damages are imposed when your certified payrolls are late. So, um, and for Davis-Bacon, for federal projects, the requirement is the payrolls are to be submitted seven days after the close of the payroll period. So that's even shorter. So just keep that in mind. There are liquidated damages. There are funds that will be assessed against the contractor for submitting their payrolls late. And if you submit the payrolls, it's like, oh, I didn't submit my payrolls. Here's all my payrolls now. You're still going to be subject to those liquidated damages because they were in fact late. So do yourself a favor, get your certified payroll people um, on a calendar, on a system where they're going to submit this on a regular basis so that nobody has to be subject to that. All weeks have to be accounted for on a project. So <clears throat> let's just say the project started April 1. I'm a subcontractor. I'm not going to start until the 21st. So when I start on that, so I don't need to, I don't need to submit certified payrolls before I start on the project saying I'm not working. But when I start working on April the 21st, I'm going to submit a certified payroll for every week I'm on that project until I'm done and off that project. And if for some reason I am not working on a particular week, I will submit a statement of non-performance. So as we're going through and we're checking for prevailing wage compliance, it's easy for us to see, okay, we had a work, they were performing work, we'll look at that payroll. Oh, we have work, they're performing work, we'll look at that payroll. Oh, 
they have a statement of non-performance. That means they did not perform any work on that project that week. Week four, okay, I've got certified payroll and we're gonna take a look at that. If you don't submit the, the statement of non-performance, we don't know if you were on the project or you weren't on the project. We don't know if we have to go chase you down to get a payroll or not. So LCP Tracker's got a super simple way. You go in, you click the week, you check the box. It said, we didn't perform any work this week and you certify it. So it's a very, very simple process. So you need to account for every week from the first week you worked until the last week that you finished the project. Um, so just please keep that in mind. So each contractor has the obligation to maintain complete and accurate uh, payroll records. This includes time cards, canceled checks, wage statements, uh, check stubs that detail the, the, the amounts paid and the deductions, okay? These are things the contractor is required to have so that if we have to engage in a more detailed um, review of your records. We'll say, you know, this just isn't looking right. Give me, give me the time cards for the workers for this week, or give me the time cards for this particular worker, or give me the cancel check. I understand some of you do direct deposit and that's fine. You know, give me, give me the wage statements, the pay stubs. Um, and when a contractor says, well, well, we don't keep time cards. State requirements, county requirements that you keep these records, it's your burden to keep them. And, and so if an employee tells me, I worked all these hours and you don't have a time card that can substantiate different hours, and, you know, we go through this whole, you know, who's telling me the truth and what, whatnot. You don't have records. I'm going to have to believe what I'm being told. Um, so please do yourself a favor. Make sure you have accurate time cards. Make sure you have uh, canceled checks. If for some crazy reason you are paying your employees in real cash, not a check, real cash, you absolutely positively need to have some type of wage statement that shows hours worked, uh, rate of pay, deductions. You need some kind of receipt from that worker um, that that worker's been paid. And, and we have had instances where for whatever reason, a particular worker didn't have a checking account and they needed to be paid in cash. But we need the backup documentation to be sure that that worker has been properly paid. A contractor is also liable for the underpayment of prevailing wages by all of your sub-tier subcontractors. So think of it this way, you're the guarantor. You're the guarantor of anybody down the food chain that you're, that you're um, employing as a subcontractor or a sub-tier subcontractor. So let's just say I'm, I'm the plumbing subcontractor and I have a sub-tier subcontractor. Well, if that sub-tier subcontractor does not pay proper prevailing wage rates, I am on the hook for the difference between what the worker was paid and prevailing wage rate. And my prime contractor is also on the hook if for some reason the sub can't pay and I can't pay, then the prime contractor can be paid. And what happens is liquidated damages that apply to this sub-tier subcontractor, that money is going to be withheld from the prime contractor. So the prime contractor is going to say, hey, plumbing contractor, I don't, I, that money's withheld by the county. I can't do anything about that, you're going to have to work with your sub and get that taken care of. And I'm going to turn around and say to my sub, hey, you know, the prime's money being held, which means my money's being held, which means you've got to fix this. 
So um, just keep that in mind that it's the money when we're withholding money, it typically is being withheld from the prime contractor. But everybody in that, what I call the food chain, down to that offending con subcontractor is responsible for the payment of those wages. So let's just review for a second what the liquidated damages are. So if you have late payroll, so if it's more than 14 days after the close of the pay period, it's $10 per calendar day for the pay late payroll submission. Just keep that in mind. If there is a worker underpayment, including an overtime classification, that penalty is, or that liquidated damage, excuse me, is $20 per worker per day. That amount is fined even after the correction has been made. So if you've underpaid a worker and you get an assessment from CCMI in the county that says, hey, you've underpaid this worker, you can be assessed $20 per worker per day for the underpayment. And you'll say, oh, but I, you know, oh, thank you. Um, I'll write that check next week. And you write that check and you're going to say, hey, is the penalty going to go away or the liquidated damage going to go away? The answer to that is no. Um, those, those liquidated damages are assessed um, if there's an underpayment. And here's a bigger penalty, $50 per day for not posting prevailing wage rates on the job. So that's important to know as well. Let me just give you some comparisons. So if you think these, these liquidated damages are high, um, let me just compare how crazy it is um, in California. So if you have delinquent payrolls, it's $10 per day. In California, it's $100 per day per worker. So if you have five workers on the project, it's $500 a day. The underpayment of wages or misclassification in Maryland is $20 per day per worker. In California, it's $200 per day per worker. And your failure to post wages is $50 per day in Maryland. California doesn't have a corresponding um, penalty, but if you have an apprenticeship violation, it's $100 per day. So um, Maryland, as, as states go, are, are not um, overreaching in the amount of liquidated damages that they um, request. So I've got a couple of links here that may be helpful to you about prevailing wage. If, you, if you're not that familiar with prevailing wage, if you generally don't, haven't worked on projects, you're a smaller contractor and you haven't worked on projects over, you know, because most of your work is way under $500,000, but here now we have a new threshold of $250,000. So there are some links here that may be helpful to you. All right, let's move on to federal Davis-Bacon. Davis-Bacon is the name of a law that was passed in the 1930s to impose prevailing wages on um, public funded construction projects. And while the threshold for, Mer for Montgomery County is 250,000, the threshold for federal Davis-Bacon projects is $2,000. So you can be working on a fairly small project, but if there's $2,000 or more of federal funding in it, then federal prevailing wage law will apply. So I'm gonna use the term federal prevailing wage law and Davis-Bacon interchangeably as um, covering that. So federal Davis-Bacon requirements will preempt the state and county requirements. So that means if you're working on a project that has for the county that has federal prevailing wage obligations on it, then only the uh, then only the prevailing the federal prevailing wage obligations will apply. The um, Montgomery County prevailing wage 
uh, requirements will not apply. It will be only the federal requirements. So that's kind of nice. That's not the way it is in all the states. So you're going to be working on projects that require state prevailing or county prevailing requirements or federal prevailing requirements. You don't have to deal with both of them at the same time. <clears throat> How do you know? How do you know you've got a federal Davis-Bacon project? Well, first and foremost, the wage determinations, the federal wage determinations are gonna be published in the specifications when they're soliciting the bids. There's also required federal Davis-Bacon language in the projects that'll say, hey, this project is subject to, you know, the Davis-Bacon Act or subject to federal prevailing wage requirements. There's very specific contract uh, requirements that will be included in the bid specifications. The prevailing, the federal prevailing wage rates are locked in at the time of the bid, on the bid date, unless the project is not awarded within 90 days. And for housing projects, there are some special rules if construction doesn't start within 90 days of closing. Um, <clears throat> so this usually doesn't happen. Uh, Montgomery County is usually really good about awarding the contracts promptly. Every once in a while, I think if there's a bid protest or something, we'll go beyond the 90 days. But that is really a rarity. So the wage rates will be locked, on, locked in based on the time of bid. Again, the workers are paid based on the classification of work they perform, not their job titles, not what's in the union agreement. And you should know that Davis-Bacon rates and classifications are not identical with Maryland and Montgomery County rates. So you can't just say, oh, I'm working on this prevailing wage project. I know all about that. I've, I've worked on this other project for Montgomery County. I'll just pay those wage rates. Uh, no, you've got to look at the federal prevailing wage rates and the different classifications of work and pay the worker not less than, you can always pay them more, but not less than the amount that's set forth in that federal wage determination. Um, some of you may be aware that surveyor work used to be covered under the Federal Davis-Bacon Act. That is no longer the case. Um, in, I want to say, December of 2020, um, the Department of Labor issued an AAM, which is an all-agency mem memo, and they issued AAM 235, and that said, hey, we're not gonna cover surveyors. They had originally said they were gonna cover surveyors in AAM 212 back in 2013. And in 2020, they said, oh, just kidding, surveyors are not covered by prevailing wage. When you are looking at the federal determination, you may find that there is, there's not a classification there that you need. And so instead of just calling Steve or us, there's actually a formal procedure where you can request what's called a conformance. It's using a special form called an SF-1444 and we fill out the form and we send it to the Department of Labor and the Department of Labor is to respond within 30 days and say is, yes, we approve of this conformance or no, we don't approve of this conformance. This is the wage rate that you should pay. So for example, let's just say for some crazy reason, there's no classification for roofers. We gotta put a roof on the building. So I would send in, um, you would wanna contact Steve or CCMI, um, probably Tracy, who's our, our key contact in Maryland and say, hey, Tracy, I, I can't find this wage rate and we need to ask for a conformance. You can't just say, oh, I'm just going to pay them X rate, or I'm just going to pay them what Maryland uh, prevailing wage rate is. No, you have to go through this conformance process. And you can say, hey, I'm, I want to pay what the Maryland rate is. Here's the wage rate. Here's the fringe benefit. But we need to submit that to the Department of Labor's conformance division and have them look at it and bless it. 
if they come back and say, oh, you wanted to pay, I don't know, $20 an hour for a roofer and $5 in fringe benefits, and the, and the conformance office can come back and say, no, we're not going to approve that, we're, but we are going to approve a rate that's $35 for a roofer for wages and $10 for benefits. Um, so if they deny the conformance, they have to tell you what wage classification um, is going to apply and what those wage rates are. So nobody's left in the dark. Now, this conformance can be requested at any point during the project. It has to be done before the project is completed. So my suggestion is let's do this sooner as opposed to later. So when you're working on a federal Davis-Bacon project, you know somebody should be flipping through that wage determination to see, do we have all of our classifications there? And if not, let's get that classification um, submitted to the Department of Labor. I sometimes get asked, well, what happens if the Department of Labor comes back with a classification and a wage rate that's higher than I'm already paying? The U.S. Department of Labor allows the contractor a reasonable period of time to go and pay that restitution, and it is not counted as a wage violation. But you've got to move quickly. You've got to move promptly. They typically require that restitution to be made within uh, one pay period. Nobody's going to go crazy if it takes you two pay periods to make this work, but you can't hold on to it for months and months and months and not do that. So anyway, there's this conformance process. Um, you have to, we have to submit the conformance. The county is the one who has to submit the conformance. So you can't fill out the form and send it into them on their own. They will send it back to you and say, we can't help you. We have to have the agency be the one that submitting the conformance. So let us help you with that project. Here's a conformance form. Again, I never fill out just this form. We fill out this form, but I give them a scope of work. I tell them where the wages came from, um, any backup documentation I can to speed that process along. <clears throat> the other requirement is that federal Davis-Bacon prevailing wage has got to be paid weekly. Um, and there is uh, a law called the Contract Work Hour Safety Standards Act that requires time and a half for all work over 40 hours in a week. Davis Bacon does not have a state, uh, does not have an, a daily overtime like the state does, but it does have um, an overtime after 40 hours a week. And there's actually a monetary penalty if you fail to pay overtime after 40 hours in a week. The current um, assessment is $31 per day per worker. And somebody says, $31? Yep, it was $29 last year. And <clears throat> what happened was it used to be $10 for decades. And then when uh, Barack Obama was president, he said, we're going to index that. Um, and he raised it to $15 um, per violation, and then we index that. So it's currently at $31 an hour. If there are specific holidays which are required on your federally funded project, they will be listed in the Davis-Bacon wage determination. So you're going to have to look at that wage determination. And I have to tell you, there aren't a lot of holidays, but there are some. And there's more showing up um, than you know there used to be. Uh, frequently, it's um, Veterans Day, um, and so it's not just Christmas and New Year's and Labor Day and Fourth of July. Um, it's other holidays as well. So you need to take a look at the Davis Bacon language. So in that wage determination, the holidays will be listed. I'm gonna talk about this ever so quickly, and then I'm going to tell you how you can legitimately not have to do this. So Federal Davis-Bacon has this melded overtime. So if you work your workers in two different wage classifications, 
they have you meld the rates so that you pay overtime on this melded rate. It's just a little crazy. So let me tell you how we don't have to do this. The exception to the melded rate over time is if you have a policy that's communicated to your employees before they begin work. In my opinion, it should be a written policy. The regulations don't require it to be a written policy, but I don't know how you prove it if you don't. You should have a written policy that says, we pay over time based on the specific um, classification of work you are performing during that overtime. I make it part of my onboarding process when I hire a new employee. I have that policy written out. I have the employee review it and sign it. And then I have that I've met the second requirement. The employee agrees with the policy. So I have a policy. It's communicated to the employees before they begin work. The employee agrees. And then the only burden left is I, the employer, have to have sufficient documentation <clears throat> to show what differing types of work were performed during the regular day versus the overtime. So if I just have a time card <clears throat> that says 47 hours and I, you know, and the worker worked some of those as a carpenter and some of those as a laborer, but the time card only says <clears throat> 47 hours, you're going to be caught doing this crazy formula every week for that worker. Instead, your time card needs to reflect, okay, this is this is the work I performed this day. So maybe your time card shows I performed, you know, um, I perform on Monday, I performed eight hours as a carpenter. On Tuesday, I performed four hours as a carpenter and four hours as a laborer. And on Wednesday, I performed 10 hours as a laborer. And so I go through that process. So when I get to overtime, I can see what work I performed during the overtime. So maybe I perform three hours of labor's work and two hours of carpentry work. And then I can pay specifically based on that detail. So it's not that difficult to fall into this exception. You have to, in my opinion, have a written policy, communicate it to your employees before they begin work on the project, have the employee agree to that policy and then you have to have the documentation typically time cards that are going to show the different classification excuse me cal classifications worked for those individuals federal apprenticeship is slightly different not uh, not really different but what's really nice is that maryland has a, a reciprocal agreement with the US Department of Labor on apprenticeship. And that's gonna, that's huge. So what that means is you can employ any apprentice in any state approved program, Maryland, DC and Virginia, and the US Department of Labor automatically, automatically will recognize that. That's not true in all states, but it's true for Maryland, DC, and Virginia. They must be employed in a proper ratio and they have to be properly supervised. And as I mentioned earlier, no pre-apprentices, no trainees, no helpers. Um, everybody is paid as a journeyman or they're paid as an apprentice because they're enrolled in an apprenticeship program. This is a copy of the Davis-Bacon poster that's required to be posted on every job site. So when we go out to do our on-site interviews on federally Davis, federal Davis-Bacon projects, we're going to be looking for this, um, this poster. It comes in English. It comes in Spanish. You can just Google Davis-Bacon poster in English, Davis-Bacon poster in Spanish. You can print this out, it prints out on eight and a half by 11, throw it up there. What you do need though, is you do need 
to put in here contact. So if somebody has a question about whether they're being paid the correct prevailing wage rate, you can put in either Steve Nagara's information or you can put in CCMI's information. Most of the time when we do a pre-construction conference and we talk about this form, feel free to put in CCMI's contract Contractor Compliance and Monitoring Inc. and put in Tracy Van Sant's name, phone number, and email. So if somebody has a question, they can pick up the phone, they can send her an email, and we can follow up with that question. Let me go back for a second. Most of the time, I just want to assure all the employers on the phone, most of the time when we get an inquiry from a worker, it's a, you know, it's a simple, it's a simple question. I don't know. What am I supposed to be making as a painter? Well, maybe they didn't know that the wage rates were available, or maybe they didn't want to go into the trailer because they didn't think they didn't want somebody thinking that they were, you know, questioning their employer, but they were just curious, how much does a painter make? So it's super easy for us to look that up, tell them that and the employee feels that that they've been well taken care of. So, you know, we don't get a bunch of calls from workers going, hey, you know, we're not getting paid the correct prevailing wage rate. You know, most employers on these projects are all good, upstanding contractors. And if they're making mistakes, they are honest mistakes that we're going to help you try and correct. I-9s. I-9 forms are um, required. They've been, they've been, federal law for a long time. Um, federal Davis-Bacon law says that the U.S. Department of Labor at any point in time can come in and audit any of their projects and can request I-9 forms. To be honest with you, I have not been on a project in probably 10 years where the Department of Labor requested I-9 forms. Um, so it's not a high priority, but you just need to know that everybody who works on your project must be um, legally able to work here in the United States. Here are some links that I think would be helpful to you um, on your federal prevailing wage projects. So if you've never done a federal prevailing wage project, um, oh, my apologies. Um, Wage determination. So you should really never need to worry about wage determinations. The county is required to provide the wage determinations to you. Um, so they will be getting that to you. Um, this has been changed to sam.gov. I'll correct the slide deck and send it over. But if anybody is listening to this on the recording, WDOL.gov has been changed to SAM, S-A-M.gov. That's as in Uncle Sam. Um, but again, you don't have to go look up the wage determinations. The county provides those to you um, in the bid documents. If you need some kind of Davis-Bacon overview because you're not familiar with it, you're welcome to go to this link. Um, and then here is the link to the um, field operations handbook. So the U.S. Department of Labor has the law. Then they have regulations. And those regulations can be found on at Title 29, Code of Federal Regulations, Section 5. And then they have a field operations handbook, which kind of details, you know, more questions and how they interpret um, overtime, how they interpret um, apprenticeship, how they classify workers. So that field operation handbook right now um, can be found at that website. I've also included a link to the federal um, certified payroll form. Don't worry about the federal certified payroll form. You're gonna submit your information through LCP tracker. And, and we're going to get it and it's going to be good. But if you wanted to take a look at that determination, you certainly could. So let me talk briefly about Davis-Bacon liquidated damages. So the federal government doesn't have a lot of monetary uh, liquidated damages that they impose. Primarily, if you've made a mistake, 
you are reprimanded, you know, don't do it again. This is the correct way to do it. And you need to understand how this is done. And do you understand how this is done? And that's great. You know, let's, let's just move forward from there. So most of the time, first offenders with good faith ether, efforts are just, are just reprimanded. And there's no monetary thing. There's nothing bad that happens to you. However, the U.S. Department of Labor can debar contractors for repeat offenses or for gross violations on a first offense. So what the heck is a gross violation on a first offense? Taking kickbacks. Kickbacks are illegal. You can't say to a worker, hey, here's your prevailing wage check. And oh, by the way, I need $1,000 back out of that or I need $100 out of that every week. Um, to make this work for me, or, you know, the company is, you know, really having cash trouble and I need you to cash your check and give me half of it back. Taking kickbacks, that's called a kickback, is illegal. It will, it is a felony. It is a federal felony. Um, and if you're found taking kickbacks, you can be subject to debarment. That means your company will not be allowed to work on any federally funded project for up to three years. That's a pretty serious um, penalty, if you will, if for not complying. So over time, after 40 hours in a week, um, again, I mentioned it's $31 per day um, per worker. It's adjusted annually. So next year it'll go up. I mean, it might stay the same or it might go up to 32 or 33 or 34, depending on whatever the um, cost of living index does. So what I, um, I got done a little early and I did that on purpose so that we could have questions. I haven't seen a lot of questions in the chat. So I'm hoping um, that we can answer any questions people have. This is our new address. So if you've been contacting us under um, an old address, we, we did uh, Change the location of our office. This is our post office box. Tracy Van Sant is our labor compliance manager out there in, uh, in Maryland. So there's her email. That's probably the best way to reach her. Um, and then she also has a phone number there, which uh, we've included. Um, so having said that, let me go ahead and open it up to questions. Please feel free to put them in the chat. Let me see. Um, I don't know. Are you seeing anything in the chat, Steve or Bethany? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. No. Anyway, so I, I know maybe you're all, you're all knowing on this and have no questions. Okay. So, uh, Van Seen, you raised your hand. Um, oh, chat has been disabled. I don't understand that. I don't know. That's a note in Q and A. All right. Am I am I on now? I think you're on mute. That's what I was calling to say. The chat was disabled, so we couldn't ask questions. Oh my goodness! Well, that's crazy. Well, I want to hear your questions. So tell so me. So my your question questions. was in reference to the apprentice ratio. Mm -hmm. I've come across in the past where there was only one apprentice on the certified payroll, just an apprentice. And when I questioned it, they told me, well, the superintendent was supervising him and superintendents, <clears throat> if they don't actually do what more than 20% of the work, they're not required to be listed on certified payroll. Is that acceptable? We can so, only have an apprentice on there? So yes, if, okay. if, if there's a superintendent on the yeah. site, mm -hmm. the superintendent can supervise the apprentice. Okay, but, but you can't have an electrical and apprentice and a laborer apprentice and a carpenter apprentice and say, hey, the supervisor's supervising all of them. No, that, it was only um, that one. So, okay. Yeah. It was so just you, only that get, one you only get one. Okay. Um, but yes, <laughs> you can have a superintendent supervise um, an apprentice. And sometimes I see that because, you know, maybe maybe a journeyman was working on the project for six hours and you have the apprentice on the site for eight hours. And we're going to say, oh, two hours, you weren't, that apprentice wasn't supervised. You're going to say, oh, no, 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 no. This is our, our 
you know, on-site superintendent who was there mm -hmm. and that superintendent was supervising the apprentice. So yes, okay. that's acceptable. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so anybody who wants, anyone else has a question, you want to raise your hand and unmute yourself? So we have a question. How is the scale wage OT calculated when a holiday falls on a Sunday? So the issue is whether or not you worked on that Sunday. Because if you did not work on that Sunday, um, then no overtime is required. If you work. So if you work and the holiday falls on Sunday, then the overtime of time and a half is required. Now, many employers choose to pay holiday at double time. <clears throat> yeah. But does that answer the question? So if you don't work, if the holiday falls on, um, I don't, I, I don't have anything from Davis Bacon that says, hey, if Christmas falls on Sunday, there's nothing that says, hey, if you work Monday, you have to be paid the holiday rate. There are in other states, but I don't think there's anything under Davis Bacon that requires that. I can go uh, double check and circle back with Steve on that. But um, so only if you work. All right, other questions? Don't see any yet, but we will um, wait and see if people are putting them in the chat, okay. So the question is, we plan to distribute the training PowerPoint presentation. Um, I would say yes, and I'm gonna go back and change that one link and send you a clean slide deck with that one correction um, so that that can be taken care of. Uh, the next question is, what is the classifications for custodial and janitorial work? So this is the issue. If you are performing custodial or janitorial work on an active construction site, <clears throat> that typically will fall under a labor classification, typically an unskilled labor classification or a general labor's classification. Um, is where it, it typically falls. Um, and people say, well, it's janitorial work and janitorial work typically is not covered under prevailing wage. Well, that's true once the project has been delivered to the county. Um, and you know, you're gonna use janitorial services moving forward, that's not covered by prevailing wage. But if you're having, for example, if you have a crew come in and their job is to spiffy everything up before you deliver it to the county. So you got somebody who's coming in and, I don't know, washing all the windows and vacuuming all the carpet and washing all the floors and whatever. That janitorial service is part of that active construction project and you will have to pay laborers it's typically labor's classification. It's either an unskilled, depending on state or federal, I mean, local or federal, uh, could be an unskilled labor. It could be a general construction labor. What is the area of practice? Um, okay. So this is this is some crazy thing that Federal Davis Bacon does. So when they go out and do an area practice survey, they're looking for what is the prevailing wage requirement or what are the work rules that have to be imposed in the area of practice. And that would typically be in Montgomery County, in perhaps Metro, you know, Washington, DC Metro. Um, an area of practice is typically kind of your geographical area. Um, and that's just a, a term of art that um, is used.
So while I'm waiting for other questions, let me just also talk ever so briefly, and I want to invite Steve to jump in here too, for the changes of expanding um, the definition of prevailing wage in Montgomery County. So, um, you know, it includes, um, you know, maintenance of roads. Um, so, I mean, a lot of people know, well, yeah, I know we were paving the road. I get that. That's a new payment. But, you know, the maintenance work is covered. Um, <clears throat> you stated Montgomery County prevailing wage should be reported in LCP tracker. Are they also to be reported to DLLR? Um, I... I don't know the answer to that. My assumption is no. Um, I don't know but, if DLLR has a separate obligation to report that, but the wage rates we're using are the prevailing wage rates that DLLR has issued. So right. Steve, if it's is there an, a separate obligation to report payroll to DLLR? No, if it's a full county funded project, you do not need to report to DLLR. That is just for state covered uh, prevailing wage projects. Okay. Steve, do you want to add anything about the expansion of the definition of prevailing wage? Sure. Uh, that has been expanded to include uh, altering, repairing, improving, rehabbing, rehabbing resurfacing, pavement, milling. Um, improvements of any kind to any real property, including routine operation and repair and maintenance. So it's very all inclusive, um, as well as mechanical service contracts. Now, for mechanical service contracts, um, the threshold <clears throat> that they're using is actually the federal threshold for service contract act which is $2,500. So we've seen a lot of our uh, elevator maintenance contracts, uh, road contract maintenance contracts, uh, but the mechanical service contracts are the ones that are using the federal threshold of $2,500. Right. So there's another question that says, what if the contract, what is the contractor's responsibility if a subcontractor is not withholding taxes? That's beyond my purview. Um, I don't think the county is, I, you know, I, it's, it's not within our scope of work to be reporting people to the IRS. So, um, yeah, I know may I jump in? Um, this is Grace Deno. I'm the Division Chief of Business Relations and Compliance for the Office of Procurement. Um, so in general, uh, again, this is not, uh, this question does not apply to the prevailing wage law enforcement, but in general, the county would not do business with a contractor who is not in good standing with the Maryland Taxation Department. So we do not have a a uh, direct re relationship with the subcontractors that you hire, but then it would be a good practice for you not to do business with anyone that's not in good uh, standing with the taxation department uh, in Maryland also. Um, so we are not going to uh, be part uh, to uh, assist you to report your subcontractors to the Department of Taxation, but it is your obligation to report them or not to do business with them. Okay, thank you, Grace. I appreciate that. Um, I have another question. When you pay split scale per day, how much documentation is needed on the timesheet? So let's just say you're paying one worker for you know, four hours a day as a laborer and six hours a day as a carpenter, what you know? How, what kind of documentation do you need? Um, you need documentation that makes it clear how many hours they worked in in which classification. 
So that could be something as simple as, you know, maybe there's a sign-in sheet, maybe there's a physical time card, maybe there's, um, in this day and age, a lot of, a lot of employees are checking in on their phones and checking out on their phones with, you know, various mobile apps. But when we ask about that, we're going to have to see some kind of documentation that shows how many hours they worked in one classification and how many hours they worked in the other classification. And it becomes a more complicated if they end up working overtime. So if they're working more than 10 hours a day, it's not enough to say, well, they work six hours as a laborer and six hours as a carpenter. I need to also know when that overtime occurred, what classification were they working in? So, um, you know, you need to take a look on how your company tracks that. I have some companies that, you know, track it by putting in the, the time, you know, somebody worked this classification from this time to this time, and then they work this, th this classification from this other time to this other time. Um, it depends on, on what kind of system you have and how you're tracking that. But at the end of the day, I need to have something that says, here's a time card or here's a time card record or something that says, you know, they worked so many hours as a laborer, so many hours as a carpenter. And when they worked overtime, this is what they were doing. Um, and I've seen very simple processes and I've seen very detailed processes, but that's what you need to do. Um, if one of the GC subs has prevailing wage penalties and the GC deter, deter, decide to terminate them and bring in a new subcontractor, please advise if GC is responsible for subs penalties. Um, liquidated damages are withheld from the prime contractor. <clears throat> so I would assume that the prime contractor with, would withhold that money from the subcontractor. So in some ways, I would say, yes, the prime contractor is responsible for the subs liquidated damages. So always a good reason to uh, <clears throat> for, for GCs to keep an eye on what their subcontractors are doing. When we set up LCP Tracker, a prime contractor has full read access to everything that their subcontractors submit to us. And when the reports that we do every month go out, they obviously go to the county, but they also go to the general contractor. So the general contractor knows every month what we found, what's missing, what we need to have fixed. So, you know, somebody shouldn't just say, oh, yeah, those are the reports. We'll just, you know, leave them on the computer and we'll read them later. You know, maybe somebody should open them and see what the issues are, particularly if you have a contractor you're thinking of terminating. You're going to want to make sure that um, they've either given us all the prevailing wage information we need or you're going to withhold sufficient funds to cover those issues. <clears throat> Are there any more questions? Uh, if so, you can put them in the webinar chat or in the question and answer box, either one. So I just wanna say, as we're kind of wrapping this up, that um, CCMI has had a great relationship with the county for more than 10 years now. I think we're coming up on close to 15 years. And, and our, you know, our goal is to um, help contractors understand their obligations and get everybody paid. So if you have a question, email it to Tracy um, or email it to me and um, we'll try and, and get you that guidance. Um, you know, my, my job is not, to, is not to sandbag you. My job is to help you be successful on your projects. 
And so if you're not understanding something correctly or you have a question, I would really invite you to um, contact Tracy or myself um, because we want you educated because if you're educated then the next project you do, um, there aren't those questions and it goes smoother. And we're all about getting the project built. We're all, you know, I understand that, that it's important we get this prevailing wage information done and being paid correctly. But we want the project built and we want to make it easier for you to do that. So if you have questions, please, please, please don't hesitate to um, give, us a, give us a holler. So uh, I will give everyone a chance for one last question or anything else that you are curious about, anything else that Deborah can answer or that we can answer here. Okay. I don't see any more uh, questions in the chat box. So um, I'd like to thank you, Deborah, for uh, being our webinar host today and for all your valuable information. Thank you for sharing all the information today with us. And we will um, collect the PowerPoint and the uh, presentation, the recording from today, and we will post it on our website. And we wanna thank you all for joining us today. Um, I believe uh, Steve, uh, put his contact information in the chat box earlier. If you have any questions, um, you can contact Steve. And uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.